Welcome to the first episode in a Legendarium series called England After 1066. In part one, A Kingdom Ruled by Evil Spirits, we will talk about how Duke William of Normandy, after the Battle of Hastings in October 1066, imposed both his rule and a new aristocracy upon the English. England, as the English knew it, perished at the Battle of Hastings on October 14, 1066. According to the Bayo Tapestry, an arrow struck King Harold Godwinson in the eye. As the wounded monarch tried to remove the arrow, several Norman knights chopped off his head. Axe-wielding English Huscarls tried to defend King Harold's body, but horse-riding Norman knights felled them with sword and lance thrusts. Of the 17,000 Normans and English who fought at Hastings, 6,000 lay in what the Normans called Fon Lec, the Lake of Blood. For several days, the victorious Duke William camped at Hastings to await the final surrender of what remained of the English ruling class. Meanwhile, his Norman knights took armor, boots, and weapons from the dead English as they drank, feasted, and sang victory songs. Instead, England's governing council, the Wintagamot, led by Archbishop Stigand of Canterbury, defiantly elected the 14-year-old Edgar the Aetheling as their king. Though Edgar had an impressive pedigree as the grandson of King Edmund Ironside and son of King Edward the Exile, he lacked the age and experience to effectively lead English resistance to the invading Normans. With almost half the English aristocracy dead or in flight after Hastings, Stigand could not provide Edgar with an army. Upon realizing both English defiance and vulnerability, Duke William chose to make his point more forcefully. Unable to storm London Bridge, William took a circuitous route through Canterbury, Micheldover, and Hertford towards the Thames River. Along the way, William burnt homes, stole livestock, cut down grain, and put anything remaining to the torch. Most of the English who had their villages burned were forced to flee into the countryside where most of them would starve during winter. Through this atrocity, William showed the English that their native rulers could not protect them. As Duke William prepared to cross the Thames River, Archbishop Stigand gave up his desperate attempt to organize English resistance. Instead, he convinced Edgar to resign his crown and hand the kingdom over to Duke William. Stigand then organized cheering crowds to greet the new king. The leading families of London swore fealty and turned over hostages to William of Normandy. To give his barefaced power grab a fig leaf of legitimacy, William claimed to be the true successor of Edward the Confessor, the English king who died without an heir in January 1066 and opened the door to the Norman conquest. Medieval people often saw omens and they recorded plenty upon Edward's death. One chronicler observed a comet in the sky which he called a hairy star and described as a portent of disaster. Additionally, gale force winds felled great trees and brought down stone churches. King Edward the Confessor himself dreamed that God told him England would be given over to evil spirits, and when Edward asked when England would become free again, God replied that evil would only leave when a tree split by lightning grew back together of its own accord and began to turn green once more. Indeed, a storm had come to England. Duke William insisted on being crowned at Edward the Confessor's tomb. Archbishop Stigand refused to officiate the coronation of a man he described as covered in the blood of men and an invader of others' rights. 
So the unhappy duty fell to Aldred, Archbishop of York. Aldred presented the new king in English, while Geoffrey of Constance did so in French. As custom dictated, the English gathered outside the church began shouting an acclamation of their new king. Norman soldiers outside Westminster Abbey thought the English were rioting, perhaps even trying to kill King William. So they set fire to the houses around the abbey, which filled with smoke. Most people fled Westminster. King William himself continued in a service led by a terrified priest in a half-empty chamber filled with smoke and ash. For the first time in his life, William was seen trembling in fear. During his Christmas court of 1066, King William seized the estates of English thanes who had died at Hastings and gave them to the lords who served him during the Hastings campaign. As part of the land seizures, William's French-speaking men forcibly married English widows, many of whom lost their husbands at Hastings. They had to share their bedchambers, homes, and lives with foreign invaders who may well have murdered their husbands. Even worse, their children found themselves with Norman fathers-in-law. Few lords profited more than William's half-brother, Odo of Bayeux. He had supplied a hundred ships for the invasion, and being a bishop he could not shed blood, so at Hastings Odo fought on horseback with a club. In exchange for his service, King William made Odo the Earl of Kent, and soon he owned land in 22 counties, along with new castles at Dover and Rochester. In the spring of 1067, Duke William felt secure enough in England to return home to Normandy, with Odo effectively governing England for him. King William brought some of the greatest men of England, like Edgar the Aetheling, Archbishop Stigand, and Earl Morcar of Northumbria, to Caen as hostages. He paraded them before his court, and Norman notables gawked at men exotic to their eyes. Indeed, the shoulder-length hair and drooping mustaches of the English caught particular attention. Most Normans were clean-shaven, and even buzzed the backs of their heads to more easily wear chainmail hoods. Young Norman men began copying English hairstyles as a way to annoy their elders, yet those young knights would soon find themselves fighting in England to keep what William had conquered. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.